Howdy, Zach. I want to make it clear that I do like you, even though I'll badmouth your beliefs till I'm blue in the face. I think Christianity is a deception, and it's an ingenious deception that has evolved over millennia. It's designed to fool you and cover up its tracks. So I do think that you are being honest as you explain your worldview to the best of your ability, but I doubt your sources. And I think you're wrong. Let's make the greatest lie on earth right now. I'm going to use Christianity as a template. Let's face it, their lie is a doozy. First, we need a great lie. Not something like, green is my favorite color, but something big. Let's say that there is a god named Tony, and he exists. We're off to a good start already. The lie is big, but it is also unfalsifiable. We could stop here, but the lie would be even better if we gave it some credibility, even if it's fake credibility. Let's give Tony some witnesses. 5,000 people have seen Tony. This can cause some problems. What if one of the 5,000 people are asked? Easy enough to solve. We'll do it the same way the Jews did. We will write a retroactive history. The stories of Genesis weren't written down for centuries. Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Israel, Jacob, Joseph, yeah. Their history is retroactive. That's the fun part about retroactive history. If we want them to have seen Tony, then they've seen Tony. That's what we'll do with our 5,000 people. 5,000 people have seen Tony. It's just too bad that they're all dead. We can't really go the route that St. Paul did anymore. Telephones and airplanes kind of ruin his strategy. Paul's strategy for a retroactive history was to write about the supposed Christ, supposed death, and supposed resurrection where a supposed 500 people saw him. That's kind of like Tolkien saying, ask Gimli or Legolas or any of the 500 writers of Rohan if the Lord of the Rings were made up. Paul made this claim in a letter to the Corinthians. So let's analyze why this lie is genius. First, the lie is hearsay. Paul never saw Christ at this event. And his only claim to interaction with Christ is an unfalsifiable claim that he saw Christ in a personal vision, which later leads him to stop killing Christians but instead take over their entire belief structure. Second, in order to check Paul's facts, a Corinthian would need to travel several hundred miles to get to Jerusalem to find a group of nameless people who have aged 30-ish years, which means that they are either dead now or were children when they saw the supposed event. Third, if such an investigation took place, and that's a huge if, and the findings were that the claims are bogus, what is a Corinthian to do? Is one lone Corinthian going to uproot a religion almost 30 years old? That's the claim that Lee Strobel and William Lane Craig make. They think that a person finding out the claims of Paul were false would uproot the religion. <laughs> what wish thinking! What ignorance about their own Bible's history! They totally disregard the slapdash editing job done by the early church. There are dozens of Gospels about Jesus, and a lot of them claim that Jesus was just a mortal man who performed no miracles. The four Gospels selected were selected by popularity, and not by truth, and they disagree with each other. Anyone or any text that refuted the works of Paul or Christ's divinity was cast out of the early church as a heretic, although the genealogies of Jesus that run through Joseph and not God still somehow made the cut. Should I also mention that this canon committee is deciding that works are true and what works are heresies centuries after the events took place, all the witnesses are dead, and only this mess of writings remain? Do I also need to mention that this early church is biased, picking the words that let the church remain a church, keep the religious leaders in power, keep Christ divine? This is going to be very hard to replicate in our lie about Tony, but maybe we should include a process of denouncing, exiling, and making sure that counterclaims to Tony's divinity get silenced, are dangerous to make, and get rejected in favor of the more popular version of the story. Let's give Tony some superpowers to defend his credibility. Let's make the unfalsifiable claim that Tony loves his word and truth, and has endowed certain people with the wisdom and foresight to only write down what is true about him, and to reject everything that is not true. Let's not mention any of this in the holy book about Tony, though. Let's just make that up after the fact and reserve it for people that doubt us. First, we'll get rid of all the contradictory claims that deny what we say, and then let's set Lee Strobel and William Lane Craig loose and have them ask why there isn't any contradicting claims. As an aside, I've got a newspaper article written about Jesus Christ's basketball career. I've also got a video and several images about Jesus Christ's career highlights. I've yet to see anyone denounce these claims as false, and if such an obvious lie as Christ's NBA career isn't ever contradicted, then what makes you think that I can find a contradiction of a retroactive history written 2,000 years ago amongst a culture that edits its own history and documents in a way that would make Big Brother jealous? Well, what about motivation? I read a book once about how to convince people to change their behavior. 
it turns out that people are motivated by one of two things, to avoid pain or go towards pleasure. Fear or greed is what it boils down to. Let's give people both and crank up the dial to infinity. If they believe in our lie, we'll promise them an eternity of eternal happiness. If they don't believe it, we'll promise them an eternal torture and misery. What if we make doubt the enemy and belief the all-saving, all-important virtue? We'll turn people's brains upon themselves and squash the logical part with the emotional part. The instinct to survive is hardwired into us by evolution, and it has the potential to make people forego logic to ensure a perceived threat or promise. People will want to believe, and so they will. For those logical types, let's throw some apologetics at them. For the more sophisticated, we'll say that Tony has to be the first cause of the universe. We'll back it up by making up definitions of what the first cause must be, relying only on philosophical premises we ourselves make up. While we're at it, we should try to get evolution and scientific cosmology squashed in the classrooms everywhere. Because I don't care if they are true or not, they disagree with what we say about Tony. Let's just say that Tony is a super-powered personality that can't ever be found because he exists in a magical dimension outside of our universe. Let's then claim that all morals come from Tony. That way we can label all the non-Tonians as bad people and make it so that they don't count. Let's not just call non-Tonians heretics, let's demonize them. Demons, that gives me an idea. If anyone says that they doubt or that they have evidence that suggests Tony doesn't exist, we'll tell them about Jeff the great deceiver and father of lies. We'll say that Jeff has been actively misleading the people of Earth, trying to fool them into thinking Tony is fake. We'll say that everyone that disagrees with Tony's existence is actually following Jeff. That way, no one can trust anything anyone says, except for what we, the true children of Tony, have to say. The trick of apologetics is to get y'all to not worry about the truth being preserved when Christianity looks like a gigantic lie. With that, Zach, the floor is yours, and I look forward to your next response and point.